Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. We are back with ep- your host, Brandon Hall and Tom Castelli are back here with the fourth episode in the Real Estate Professional Series. And today we're going to be speaking on audits, how the IRS audits you if you do, if you are ever audited for the Real Estate Professional, what lens they come through, what they're looking for, and most importantly, how you can protect yourself in the event of an audit. 100%. And, uh, you know, the, the pre-frame for all of this is that real estate professional status is a highly litigated area. So it's really important to understand how your opponent will come in and try to rip your story apart. And that's what today's episode is all about. We're going to be pretty much going through the IRS audit technique guide. The IRS audit technique guide is given to field auditors. It's their pre-frame to, uh, to, to before they come out and audit you. It also gives them a structural framework to step through. Um, as they are going through the audit. So we're going to go over some questions that they are going to ask you uh, and in the steps that they're going to go through. We've assisted taxpayers on real estate professional audits. Um, unfortunately, never front to end. We always get pulled in in the middle or towards the end when the taxpayer is already lost. And we, what we can say is that the reason that people lose real estate professional audits is, is one of three reasons, typically. Poor record keeping, um, so just like not keeping records, not being able to prove anything. Uh, logging time, that is not material participation time, like education, research time, investor level time, travel time. And they're unable to corroborate their participation in the rental activity. So things just don't match up. So typically poor record keeping, logging time that's not material participation, and not being able to substantiate the fact that they actually did participate in the activity. So those are the three things that we typically see. Uh, in the real estate professional audits that we assist with. So let's jump into the IRS audit technique guide and let's talk about some pre-frames that the guide gives to auditors. So there's some things in the guide. There's some, there's some phrases in the guide that we wanted to pull out for you guys. And, and, and anybody can view these guides, by the way. Uh, the IRS produces or publishes audit technique guides for a bunch of different code sections. This one is called the IRS Audit Technique Guide for Passive Activities. If you just Google that, it'll take you right to it. It's PDF. It's like 65 something pages. Actually, it might be a little bit bigger than that. But um, preframe. Let's talk about the preframe. So some words that are used in the guide. One, rental activities by nature normally do not require significant day-to-day involvement. So that's what the IRS audit technique guide is telling its auditors. It's also saying for many taxpayers using any kind of outside management, the only material participation test available is the 500 hour test. And in many situations, uh, the other tests will not apply. Also in many circumstances, an individual rental activity will not require 500 hours of participation, nor will the taxpayer have sufficient time available to spend 500 hours on each individual rental real estate activity. Wow. So, so between those three preframes, right? First we say, Rental activities don't take a lot of time. Second, if you have property management, the only test you can actually get is 500 hours, which makes sense. You know, remember those three material participation tests that we said that we see most often. It's you, your participation is substantially all, which you can't have if you have a property manager. Uh, your participation is 100 hours and more than anyone else, which you also can't have. That's what the IRS te- audit technique guide is saying. You can't have that if you have a property manager. So the only test available to you is the 500 hour test. And then they go on to say, yeah, by the way, an individual rental activity is not going to take 500 hours. So basically landlords are hosed. <laughs> that, that's the free frame that they're giving to the auditors here. But it's important for you to understand because your auditor may not own re- real estate, right? They might, they may not own rental real estate. I know that rental real estate takes a lot of work. I'm sure if you're listening to this, you know, it takes a lot of work, Tom, you know, it takes a lot of work, but that's not the point. The point is, is that you get an auditor that's looking at your situation that doesn't know. The only thing that they know is this preframe. Rentals are easy. You can't, you can't hit 500 hours if you have a property manager or 500 hours is the only thing that you can hit if you have a property manager and, and you can't hit it on a single rental activity. So you have to really prove your case. That's the point. Yeah. So you want to take, yeah, we're going to go through what you need to do that, but you definitely want to make sure you take this, this stuff seriously because they're coming in and they're coming in with the mentality of you're wrong and we're right. That's what they're coming in with. Right. Right. All the time. And then they, they also pre-frame it. They say a taxpayer may attempt to manipulate the passive activity rules by inappropriately claiming to be a real estate professional or conversely not claiming to be one uh, if certain activities are generating net income. <clears throat> so, you know, they're, they're, they're basically telling their auditors that you have an incentive to claim real estate professional status. And you might be doing that 
by manipulating your time logs. And so they're going to be looking at that. All right, now that we talked about the pre-frames, let's talk about the steps that the auditor is actually going to go through as they're auditing you. All right, so step number one, they're going to review your situation to make sure they fully understand all of your income streams and pretty much all the activities that you have going on. Um, they're going to review your Schedule E, uh, so that's where you report your rentals. They're going to review your maybe perhaps Schedule C. They're going to review your, your uh, <clears throat> excuse me, whatever partnerships or, or corporations that you're involved in, your W-2 activities. They want to see basically, you know, is, is there any chance that you're actually going to, that you're qualifying as a real estate professional? What case can they build around uh, stating that you don't because of all these other businesses that you're involved in or, you're, or you perhaps have a full-time job? Yeah, one other thing that I, I thought was interesting about the audit technique guy, because we get we get these questions a lot, <clears throat> is that they're going to look at the signature block on your tax returns to see what you list as your profession. And that doesn't actually help you or hurt you under the uh, passive activity rule, section 469. And I, I don't know of a tax court case offhand that specifically references that. But just know that the, the auditor is going to look at that to build a case in their own mind, uh, either for you or against you. So, you know, if you are, I, I think what they're really looking for there is like, if I'm a salaried employee or if I'm a CEO of a company or something, you know, they're going to look at that and say, well, you're a CEO or you say that you're a salaried professional or how could you possibly also be a real estate professional? So you might just have to do a little bit of extra defense if, uh, play, play a little bit of extra defense if if you don't put real estate professional on that signature line. But one thing that I want to make clear, putting real estate professional on your signature line will not make you a real estate professional. I know there's some people out there that like claim that and that's just hogwash. <laughs> so, uh, but so, so once they kind of get the understanding in step one, right? So, so they're just trying to understand what you're all about, all the different income streams that you have. Um, step two, they're going to start scrutinizing. So they're going to dive into it. They're going to figure out who's the real estate professional. Is it husband or wife? They're going to identify all your real property trades or businesses that you materially participate in. They're going to assess it for material participation. They're going to request your documentation for timekeeping, and they're going to closely examine it. If you don't have timekeeping records um, and you indicate that, then they're going to make a note that you prepared the time log while under audit, and that's going to count against you if you go to tax court. Uh, they're going to scrutinize the activities that you're involved in, even if they're not real estate activities, and even if you don't get paid for them. So maybe it's volunteer work. Maybe it's like going and being on the PTO at your kid's school. Maybe it is a part-time job. They're going to look at all of that because what, what they're trying to figure out is I have this time log in front of me. Did you, could, could you have possibly worked that much time based on all of your other activities? So be careful with your child uh, or not child, sorry. Be careful with your um, community involvement, your charity work all that time it will be taken into account when they're assessing material participation. Uh, if hours are suspicious or appear inflated, they're going to ask you for examples, tons of examples. So be ready to answer, answer questions there. Yeah. And then we move on to step three. They're going to interview you, right? Uh, this is when stuff gets real, right? They're going to interview. They're going to ask questions about your personal life, your business, uh, any civic activities you're involved in. So any philanthropy, I think that what your family obligations are, what your hobbies are. Um, and all of this is being done, or again, to remember, you know, uh, they're trying to build a case in their mind uh, that you're spending too much time on all these other activities mm -hmm. that you you can't possibly qualify as a real estate professional. Um, so you have to be mindful of that too, right? Be mindful of what you're doing outside of just real estate, right? And then they're going to, they want to do this early on in the, in, the, in the examination. So this might come early. And this is what Brandon said before, why people come to us later on in the process. There's not that much that could be said. Because, you know, uh, I don't want to compare this to being arrested, but they always give you your Miranda rights. Uh, what you can, what you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. And while this is not the court of law yet, uh, perhaps for you, uh, they are going to take what you, if they are interviewing you, they're taking notes. They're going to start taking these notes down to see if later on your story changes a little bit, uh, perhaps. And that's going to make, knock you some, knock your credibility a bit. So you have to be careful what you say. And you want to make sure that if you're going into that interview, that, uh, your story, you have your story straight, for lack of a better word. And, and the final step, they're going to give you a, uh, a determination. And then at that point, you can decide if you want to contest it, if it goes against you. A lot of these real estate professional audits do go against the taxpayers. 
at least the ones that we've gotten pulled into, almost every single one goes against the taxpayers because they didn't properly prepare their records, their booking time that doesn't count like education and research time. And it's always detailed too. It's always detailed in the, in the determination, um, which is fascinating. It's just fascinating that everybody gets whacked on the education and the research hours, yet we still have people that uh, are professionals that say that education and research hours count. They don't. So you're going to get, you're going to get nailed for that. And then you get to decide at that point, do you want to contest it? And you want to keep playing that game and you might be able to contest the audit itself, or you might have to go to tax court, depending on what stage you're in. Uh, but that would be the step after that. So also in the audit technique guide are indicators that the taxpayer did not materially participate. And this is a list, right? And, and it's important to know this list so that you can, again, defend against it. The, it's, so let's start at the top. The taxpayer was not compensated for services. Most individuals do not work significant hours without expecting wage or commissions. The taxpayer's residence is hundreds of miles from the activity. So if you have a rental activity, like a short-term rental or even a long-term rental, that's a long way away from your, your, where you live, uh, that's going to be an indicator that you did not materially participate. Doesn't mean that you didn't materially participate. Just means that in their mind, uh, you, you have to really prove it out. Another one is the taxpayer has a W-2 wage requiring 40 plus hours a week. Taxpayer has numerous other investments, rental business activities, hobbies that absorb significant amount of time. There's paid on-site management. The taxpayer is elderly or has health issues. The majority of hours claimed are for work that does not materially impact operations like education like, research time, <laughs> right? Like listening to this podcast. Like listening to this podcast, doing the bookkeeping, paying bills, preparing your tax returns, reviewing financial statements, supervising your property manager. Majority of the hours claimed are for work that does not materially impact operations. So that's coming out of the audit technique guide. Uh, and then the last one is business operations would continue uninterrupted if the taxpayer did not perform the services claimed. Again, education research investor level time travel time so those are the those are the time those are the indicators that are all they're all in the audit technique guide you can go irs audit technique guide passive activities you can pull this up you can see every single one of those um, those are all indicators that the auditor is supposed to take with them to to assess whether or not you materially participated in the activities so next let's talk about the actual interview itself what questions that they're going to to be inter asking you and if you want to lead us off with that Yes. So they're going to, one of the first questions they ask you is to describe the work you perform as a real estate professional. They're also going to check the occupations by signatures and W-2s, right? So they want to, they want to make sure basically in this question, you know, they're, they're checking to see, are you really a real estate professional here? Yep. They're going to ask you, who is the real estate professional? Is it you or your spouse? And if the spouse is claiming real estate professional status, are they working full or part-time? If they're working full-time, they have to exceed 2,080 hours for the year. And if they're working part-time, they've got to exceed the part-time number of hours that they work. So they're going to try to get some clarity around who is actually the real estate professional. And they're also going to ask what percentage of the real property trades or businesses do you own? And, you know, if you, if you, if you own less than 5% of the business, then the time is not counted. So for example, if you work full-time for a property manager and you're on a W, you get paid via W-2, just because you're working full time in a real property trader business, because you don't own 5% or more, then that time is not counted. And that's IRC. That. Yeah. And then that's IRC section uh, 469C7 cap D2. So I'm glad that you brought that one up because we, we forgot to touch on that on our uh, material participation episode two episodes ago. But yeah. You, you have to own 5% of the company. So if you work full time, for a real property trader business, like a construction company, maybe a broker, maybe your brokers pay you in a W-2 and not a 1099, right? If, if you're paid 1099, you own the company yourself. It's a, it's a sole proprietorship. So you, you own hundred percent if you're paid 1099. So maybe yeah. that's the determination you need to make. But you know, we, we get people all the time that, that are paid on a W-2. They work for a construction company or a brokerage, or like you said, a property management company. And they're like, well, I, I'm doing real estate professional status stuff all the time for my company. And their company is a real property trader business, but they don't own 5%. So none of their time counts. Yeah. So it's something you got to watch out for, especially if you're an agent. You know, I've, I've worked with a few clients in the past who have said they wish they knew about this earlier. So it's something you want to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah. But they're also going to be asking who performs the services. Is it the husband or wife? 
uh, how many hours were performed by the husband, how many hours were performed by the wife. So they're going to be digging into your time log. They're going to be assessing uh, and, and they're going to be taking into all the activities each one of these folks has too. All of your philanthropy, all of your hobbies, your actual work, what you get commissioned for, your actual management of the rentals. They're going to be taking all that into account as they try to assess who actually performs the work. So in other words, they're kind of using common sense to yeah. determine whether or not you, you actually qualified. Um, they're also no, that's ask, funny that you say that because a lot of this is just common sense. <laughs> no, I know I'm, I'm sitting here and we're going through this and we're talking about it. I just can't help but think like, you know, I, I, it, they really need an audit technique, technique guide for this, really? Well, but, <laughs> but, but it's because, but, but I mean, you know, like, like again, we, we talk to 80 landlords a week and a lot of them, not, well, I don't say a lot of them, some of them, some of them want to bend the rules. They want to hear what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And really it's just bending. It's just trying to get around the common sense. So it's like, yeah, they, they have to, they have to produce this thing. And, and that's why we have to harp on it. We have to sit here and harp on it because, because uh, a few folks have ruined it for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. You, abusive, abusive rules. People. Are that's like in. labels, you know, like you, you like go in, into the grocery store and you read these weird labels. And it's like, yeah. Hey, you know, you probably shouldn't spray hairspray in your eyes. Um, so well, somebody did that the before and they hot. sued the company for it. <laughs> so now yeah. they have to say, don't spray hairspray in your eyes. And that's just why McDonald's was forced to uh, put uh, this coffee is hot in like big <laughs> letters on their, on their thing. Cause someone spilled in their lap and sued McDonald's. Are you kidding me? Comments. Anyway, to be comments fair, is- though, I mean, the McDonald's coffee is like scalding hot. I don't know. My, my wife can drink scalding hot coffee. I just can't. I don't, I'm maybe I'm too weak, too weak of a human to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, there's other questions they asked too. And then, you know, back, back to the real estate professional status, the other technique guide here, we got the material participation in rentals. They're going to ask you questions about that too. Who monitors the rental properties? You know, uh, who collects the rent? Who does the repairs? In other words, who's materially participating? Um, <laughs> and they want to know. Um, yeah. They're going to ask, you know, they ask, do you have a real estate agent or property manager or, or an employee who's responsible for the rentals? Uh, they're going to ask about each property. They're going to check Schedule E for large commissions and management fees. That's going to be a sign that uh, you're delegating those responsibilities to somebody else and you're not material participation, materially participating. They're also going to ask, does a friend or relative help you manage or monitor the property for free? Right. So, so you, can't, you can't have people helping you for free and think that, well, as long as it's not on the books, as long as I'm not paying them and there's no paper trail, I'm good. They're still going to find that out and they will find that out. They're also going to ask, does a tenant receive reduced or free rent for helping you manage the place or keep things up? So again, they're just trying to build a case. They're trying to understand, do you actually spend what you say you spend in the rental real estate activity? Um, and if you have all these other things, like if you have these people that are helping you out, but yet you still say you spend a significant amount of time, they're going to challenge it all day long. You can challenge it all day long. So you, you got to make sure that your time log is buttoned up. Um, it, actually, in the IRS audit technique guide, they give a sample time log that they want you to sign under penalties of perjury. And that time log shows the date, the hour spent, the description of the services performed, and um, how can we verify that you actually performed the services? Is there some third party? Is there a receipt that we can verify that you performed the services? Um, so, so if you're keeping a time log, it should say date, hour spent, services performed, what property it was performed for. And ideally your notes are great. So your notes are very detailed. Now, when we help people with like risk assessments, we do a lot of risk assessments for people where we'll look at their situation up front before they get audited, hopefully years before they get audited, and we'll help them understand how to button up their position, their real estate professional status position. Oftentimes it's looking at their time log and saying, hey, these are high risk hours. These are high risk hours. We're not gonna tell you to strip them out, but just know that they're high risk hours and you might not hit the 750 hour test with these hours. But another, th another piece of feedback that we often provide is you know, I'll, I'll, I'll build out, um, let's say like repairs uh, for my HVAC. I'll say repairs, HVAC property A, five days. I'll make a note, um, went to Home Depot, purchased materials, uh, coordinated contractor, and then quality inspection. And then I'll just drag the note down for the five days. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because all you're doing is you're just trying to make it easy on yourself, which I get, I totally understand. But the IRS is going to pick that apart. You got to take notes on every single entry. What did you do? What was unique about that specific entry? 
try not try to avoid um, just dragging down the notes because it's just not it's not going to help you remember what you actually did three, four, five years from now. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, you know, I think one thing that you know, I kind of a conclusion I want to draw here or something. I know I, I kind of mentioned this in I think one of the real estate professional episodes. I think it's episode one sixteen that we did. And at the end of the day, when you go through all of this. Um, as we've been discussing this entire series so far, this is not an easy thing to achieve. If you're wanting to achieve this, you really have to take it seriously. It is a business that you're running at the end of the day. If you want to be completely hands-off and you want real estate to be a passive activity for you, well, that's exactly how it's going to be. It's probably going to be a passive activity and you'll be putting yourself in a better position of just owning that and saying, you know what, I don't want to be actively involved and you're not going to be able to qualify as a real estate professional because as you can tell, a lot of things you need to do to, to qualify as a real estate professional really comes down to managing the properties themselves. And, you know, if you don't want to deal with tenants and toilets, you don't want to have to deal with being a property manager, you know, the chances of you qualifying, uh, you know, diminish significantly. And honestly, we'd rather have you say, you know what, I'm legitimately not going to qualify. I would be stretching my time and really stretching the case here. And we'd be getting creative. Um, and I'm just not going to do that. And we, we'd rather have that conversation because that, that just allows us to move on from real estate professional status and just talk about other things. There are ways, there are amazing ways to create a passive portfolio that you do not pay tax on. You have to figure out how to create passive income, but there are ways to create passive income and then use the rental passive losses to offset that passive income. Many of our clients do it and they're not real estate professionals. So many of our clients are not real estate professionals, yet they have this portfolio that generates an enormous amount of cash flow and they don't pay tax on the cash flow. That's the Warren Buffett approach to investing. Over time, I'm going to generate cash flow that I don't pay tax on because everything offsets. So my effective tax rate on my total income that I earn goes down because my total tax stays the same on my W-2 job, right? On my W-2 job, I earn 200K. Pay 50K in taxes, 25% effective rate. And then I go and I build a portfolio that earns $500,000 in cash flow over the span of 30 years. So now I earn $700,000 in total income, but I'm still only paying 50K in taxes. Now I'm less than 10%. That is the dream. That's not real estate professional status. That's just good planning and strategic. Yeah, and that's why, you know, real estate is a great asset to hold outside of your retirement accounts uh, because you can shelter your stocks and bonds and everything inside of a retirement account, but you can't do that. But, you know, you can't do that outside, right? So if you hold your real estate, you can shelter that from income. But that's a horse of another color. That's a story for another day. And I'm sure we'll have an episode on that at some point in the future. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever heard horse of another color. That's, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's good. I think it's from, so I think it's from, uh, I think it's from uh, that show, that movie. Um, what's that movie called? Uh, uh, I have no idea. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, cool, cool, cool. Good. Yeah, man, it's been a long time since I've seen Wizard of Oz. Um, all right. So my final, my final words. Did you already say your final words? Or you, you got more final words? No, that's my final words. Your final words? Okay. My final words are that real estate professional status is difficult to achieve. I hope that this series has helped you understand that. I also hope that this series reinforces uh, good habits. Or, 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 or helps you understand how to build good habits. You know, I, I, I think that this is a piece of the code that's brilliant. It's great for landlords. If you can pull it off, it's great. Time value of money, uh, that you will be able to use your passive losses to save a lot of money in taxes and accelerate the expansion of your portfolio if you can qualify as a real estate professional, no doubt about it. And we want to help you do that. But we have seen so, so much bad advice bad advice that's like borderline malpractice. Like, like you could theoretically sue people over. And the problem is, is that you're not going to find out that it's bad advice for five years. And the people that gave it to you are going to be long gone by that point, or, or they're going to be protected in some way, shape or form. So just be careful, be careful. You don't have to use us. There's tons of brilliant CPAs out there that understand this stuff, but ask them for citations. If they're, if they're telling you education and research time counts, if they're telling you 500 hours plus 250 hours of anything else, if they're telling you bookkeeping counts and reviewing record keeping counts and all that stuff and supervising your property manager counts for time towards the statutory tests, towards material participation, ask them for a citation. 
they won't be able to provide, provide you with one. I know that for a fact. So thank you very much for listening to our series. We really appreciate it. Our next series is going to be on short-term rentals. Um, and we hope to see, we hope to see you back listening there. If you have any questions, if you, if you've picked up anything on this series that you would like some further guidance on, feel free to email us at contact at the and also check us out at the tax smart real estate investors. What's that URL again, Tom? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, groups.facebook.com slash tax smart investors, or you can just go on Facebook and type in uh, tax smart investors and we'll pop right up. I think, I think if you go in, into Facebook, you have to say it's type in tax smart real estate investors, um, to find it, but it's, it's a group that we run. We've got, I think 1300 people in it or so we actually recorded one of the episodes in this session, episode three, the myths and strategies. We, we recorded that on Facebook live. So if you like, we're going to do that going forward, we'll, we'll record one episode and kind of give you behind the scenes. Um, so good, go join that group. We, we've got a lot of, a lot of people asking really good questions. We're jumping in there and answering them as much as we can. And we'd love to have you be part of it. Absolutely.